astrophysics here at George Mason. Uh, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, it's nice to meet you now. And I'm going to talk to you today to kick off quantum. We're telling you a little bit about, you know, quantum in general at a very basic level, very ultra basic level. Uh, and, um, and, and tell you a little bit about what Mason itself is doing. And then we'll kick off with some other, other additional excellent talks today and then the subsequent days as well. So hopefully we can find some ways to, to if you don't understand quantum already, help it be less scary. And if you do, help you find more ways to make it useful to the kind of things you like to do as well. So uh, this is all being put on by uh, the Quantum Science and Engineering Center. Um, which is a, a uh, uh, transdisciplinary research center with faculty coming from seven individual departments here, really spanning the gamut and showing you kind of how general quantum can be and will be in the future for everybody. So, okay. So I'm going to go ahead and just uh, just move forward here on day one. So first of all, um, I'm a little concerned because everyone in this room is a physicist that I'm seeing here. So. This is very much, you know, uh, 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 basic stuff. But hopefully, some of our virtual audience members are are not quite. Otherwise, it's going to be very, very, you know, yeah, beginner level stuff. But basically, first of all, uh, I want to talk a little bit about some of the interesting properties of quantum. So, first of all, is this? Do atoms look like this? And the answer is no. No, they do not. When we when we start to look at our universe on really small length scales. You know, on atomic length scales or length scales involving hundreds of atoms or even just a few thousand atoms, things look very, very different than um, than they seem on the macro level, and they're even more different than what you might have expected. Like Bohr did back when he was coming up with his own conception of the atom, where he was basically thinking it was like a planetary system, but writ small, where you have actual electrons undergoing orbital motion around you. In reality, it's quite, quite, quite different. It seems that nature and reality itself at small length scales at the atomic is probabilistic in nature. It's all fuzzy. We can't really say where the electron is around an atom. We can only say it has a probability of being in this location of this value. And so that's one of the parts of, of quantum physics that's really so very interesting and also so very weird and uh, running contrary to your common experience. Right? And, that, and that is that the universe itself uh, is governed ultimately by probabilities. Okay. Now, one other interesting thing about particles that are you know, existing in quantum states is that in addition to being governed by probabilities, they can exist simultaneously in two states at the same time. And this has to do with the fact that they're governed by probabilities. So we can say, you know, there's a, this is a principle called superposition. Where basically, if you have an object and it's, it's um, exhibiting a strong behavior, come on in. Wish you had some fun music to play. Uh, so, uh, uh, yeah. So, so quantum particles can under can enter into superposition states where they have a probability of being in two states at once. And so, the classic uh, uh, analogy for this that's often used is Schrodinger's cat. Now, this is very not PETA friendly. It's not very friendly to cats, um, but it does illustrate the point. And the point is that, you know, if you're really a sadist, you take a cat and you put it in a box and you put a vial of a radioactive material near it. And then you close the box again because you're a sadist. Right? And so then with some random, random Geiger counter, you're relying on decays of atoms to get off particles. So it's truly random. At some point, it'll shatter the radioactive vial and kill the cat. Okay? So, but you don't know whether the cat is alive or dead until you open the box. And so before you've opened up the box and taken a look at your cat, kind of like the cat has a 50-50 chance to be alive or dead. It's existing in a superposition of both life and death, right? So it's a zombie cat, more or less, right? So, so that's essentially the principle of superposition. And this is not a classical thing. Classical objects are here or there. They can't be here and there simultaneously with some weighted probability, okay? So that's one of the aspects of quantum that's, that's very important, very weird and very interesting. Uh, the next is wave particle duality, which you may or may not be familiar with. And so this, this has to do with light, right? And in actuality, everything, but basically there were some experiments done a very long time ago that showed light behaves a lot like a wave, which you may know, but it also can behave like a particle. 
under different conditions. And so in reality, what you have is that light exhibits a combination of wave-like characteristics and particle-like characteristics at the same time. And that might be reconcilable to yourself mentally, but um, what's really wacky is that matter does it too. And you can take uh, uh, molecules as large as ones containing 810 atoms and essentially get them to exhibit wave-like quantum interference effect with each other. Come on in. No, it's all right. Just please sign up there. That's how we get more, more support in the future. Don't forget to click subscribe. Right? That's what all the kids say. Right? So, um, so even with something with 810 atoms, like matter itself is also wave-like and particle-like as well. And so this is a very weird thing. This would be like as if you walk through a doorway and you diffracted through the doorway, right? Like, so this is very strange. This is very interesting. Um, and so our list of weird is growing here, right? We know reality is probabilistic. We know that particles and, and things can exist simultaneously in two completely different quantum states. And we also know that things exhibit wave characteristics and particle-like characteristics at the same time. So why not add one additional thing? All right, and there's an additional property that shows up in quantum physics called entanglement. Does anybody know? Has anybody ever heard of the term entanglement before who isn't a physics major? All right, good. He's not a physics major. Oh, he's heard of it. Great. Um, so quantum entanglement is a really interesting property. And so you may have heard people talk about it as spooky action at a distance. But basically, it, an analogy to like, what it would be like is as follows. So let's say I gave Akil a high five and yeah, I'm gonna pick on you even here a little bit. I give him a high five and somehow from that high five, our emotional states became intertwined. And so then I could go to the other side of the world and if I'm happy, he feels happy. If I'm sad, Akil feels sad. Much like our existing connection, right? right. So, so um, this is the idea behind quantum entanglement. When you bring two particles together and interact them with each other, their probability distributions as to what states they can be in become connected and become intertwined and they forever remain intertwined unless those particles are measured. And so now you have these two particles, I can separate one, I can keep it here on earth and I can send the other to the end of the universe. And if I measure the state of the one that I have, I automatically know what the state of the one at the end of the universe is instantaneously I have that knowledge. So this is a third, uh, an additional weird aspect of quantum that's really mind bending and mind blowing um, and, and adds to our list of weird that we have growing, right? And these are not classical concepts, right? These are not concepts of classical physics. You can't come across anything like this in classical physics. Otherwise, none of this would be a surprise to you and none of this would be weird, right? It would be part of your daily experience. The really interesting point that we're at now as a society is we've reached technological maturity to the point where we can now start taking advantage of these weird concepts in quantum physics and making new technologies that operate based upon them, right? Rather than operating in spite of them, okay? And so this is something that's been recognized at the highest level of government here in the, the US. And we were actually late to the party. We only passed our national quantum initiative back in 2018. All over the world, there are numerous quantum organizations and countries have been establishing their own strategies for quantum technology for a long time. And so the idea of this legislation was a whole government approach to make kind of a whole country approach to getting the US to be competitive and making sure they are competitive in the quantum information science and engineering landscape that's coming. Um, and so this involves all major agencies of government and also a lot of companies. Right now, the Quantum Economic Development Consortium, of which member, Mason is a member, has 132 companies actively participating, and all of whom actively uh, intend to expand their workforce in quantum over the years. Okay. So, and, and the reason why is as follows, and, and hopefully this can make the lucrative side of it a little bit more clear. Um, in that we're about to undergo what's called what's being referred to as the second quantum revolution. Okay? And so the first quantum revolution happened back in the day when we were discovering the basic principles of you know the microscopic realm, quantum mechanics, quantum physics, the essential concepts I just uh, communicated to you on the prior slide. That was the first quantum revolution. Then we began to create our first bulk quantum technology. What do I mean by that? Well, if I take silicon and I learn how to dope silicon and I learn how to fabricate silicon. 
Suddenly, I have the field of microelectronics. Suddenly, I have integrated circuits, I have transistors, and I have the entirety of the computational architecture, which supports our entire civilization here today. Right? And so the, the, the economic, the, the societal impact of that technology hitting us and what we've done with it as a species has been massive. Right? And it's hard to imagine not knowing how to use a computer today. Although I guess you could just talk to my parents. So, yeah. Well, they're not for you there. All right. So, so um, where we are now is that we've been manipulating the bulk properties of crystals, you know, like macroscopic crystals, trillions and billions of atoms, right? Now we're going to be basing our technologies on manipulation of individual quantum states, right? So, like the individual quantum state of an atom. And we're going to have a situation where superposition entanglement. These sort of wacky properties are underlying the base operating principles of the technology. And so that's very new and that's very different. And the potential for, for changing everything, just as the way that the transistor changed everything, is there. Okay. So here's some examples of where we anticipate, you know, there may be big impacts. Many of you have probably heard of quantum computers. Um, quantum computers are a little different than regular computers. Instead of having bits determined by transistors, which can be zero or one, you have qubits, quantum objects that are used to process information that can be prepared in superposition state and also entangled with each other. And so the way that quantum computer operates is to prepare all these, these, these quantum particles together. I need to clock, otherwise I'm going to blow through this time. Um, oh, well. Too bad. Uh, so uh, all these quantum problems, they're all in an combined entangled state. And when you manipulate that entangled state, you can actually process information much more efficiently and quickly than you could in a classical computer. And this is something where companies like IBM and a new um, you know, scrappy startup called IonQ are actively working to develop and build. And they've succeeded. You can actually go online and program a quantum computer this afternoon if you so desire to do so. And you can run your code on it, which is kind of remarkable. Another area where quantum will have a big impact is uh, quantum is in communication. Right now, all of our e-commerce, everything in the security relies upon public key encryption, which is basically that I use a very large number that's hard to factor in order to make sure that my transactions are secure. Right? But quantum computers are able to factor those numbers, do prime number factorization, really, really lickety split. And all of a sudden, public key encryption no longer is safe. And you can access anything. Right? So quantum computers themselves have the capability of destroying conventional encryption that we have today. But fear not, there are ways to use it to solve it too. Uh, you can actually use the properties of entanglement to create unbreakable, perfectly secure keys and distribute them. So, you know, that's why I have this Homer Simpson thing, you know, to quantum, the, the cause of and solution to all of life's com uh, communication problems. Ah, dad jokes are hitting hard. All right. So other areas where quantum can be good is in sensing, right? And so there's already an example of this in the astronomy field um, where we detected gravitational waves using something called an interferometer, which is basically you shoot light along very long paths and bounce it off mirrors and measure the interference pattern between the, the, the two different light beams when it comes back to you. Doing that, you can actually measure ripples in the reality, in reality, ripples in the fabric of space-time that are caused by two black holes orbiting each other. Right? This is crazy if you think about it. And we put this thing on Earth, where you have people and squirrels and lizards running around making vibrations, all of which would shake the two arms. Right. So the only way they were able to get the sensitivity down to the level to actually measure this effect was by using special kinds of quantum states of light called squeeze states. And that allows you to beat classical noise scores and achieve these kind of measurements. There are other things though too. You can make quantum accelerometers for position navigation and timing. The military is very, very interested in this because GPS is very easy to hack and very easy to disrupt. Right? And there's also big applications in biotechnology and biosensors as well, you know, where you're able to maybe have unique ways to identify um, the presence of foreign molecules inside of a biological host, um, and also uh, uh, just understand the basic function of biological organisms in general. Okay. And there are more applications I won't go into. There's there's applications in finance where maybe you can become a quant, right? And you can run your 
quantum computing algorithms on Wall Street. Aerospace fluid dynamic simulations tend to benefit quite a bit from quantum computing. Uh, and then drug discovery and design, you know, any kind of highly parallelizable problem can benefit from the use of a quantum computer in most cases with caveats, of course, always, but you know, writ large, this ends up to be generally true. So what we do here at QSAC, which you're going to be hearing about is we try to take a uh, transdisciplinary approach to advance quantum research and education. So we don't really care what department you come from. If you're interested in it, uh, we want to help you explore it and understand more of it if we can. All right. So we do work in quantum computing and algorithms. We work in making the materials and understanding the materials that can be used to build the next generation of quantum computers. And we do work in making sensors that can be used to uh, detect uh, things and that are enhanced by the fact that quantum states are involved. Okay. So at Mason, we're doing a lot of research, teaching, and education. We work regionally to help with K-12. So we you know, get in there at an early age and inspire young. And nationally, we work across the nation to help kind of build uh, 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 sustainable infrastructure for educating, researching, and teaching quantum science. So we've done, we've been around since 2018. Since then, we've grown quite a bit. We have very deep industry and uh, corporate partnerships at this point here, all of which are working hard in this space. Uh, we have an organizational structure, and this just shows you, you know, the kind of work that we do, again, material sensing, computing, education, all informs and interacts with each other. And we have people from all sorts of different, all, all different disciplines here. We have people from the College of Education, Humanities and Education. We have, you know, physics, ECE, chemistry, math, uh, mechanical engineering, pretty much most of the big ones that you can think of here, we have somebody in there. Um, you may know some of the people up here. So this is our, our leadership team. Um, Look, and this was just a poorly animated slide on my part, but there are lots of people who take part in this kind of research, and all of them are very interested in helping students explore this new, fascinating, and exciting area. So, you know, just as to give you a better idea of what, what the kinds of things are that we do, you know, with the materials, what do we do? Well, we have people here who grow really weird combinations of atoms together to make a crystal, and that crystal can exhibit a lot of these weird quantum properties you typically only see in a single atom, but in a bulk structure instead, right? And we also study about how to modify or deform materials in certain ways to control and dynamically change those properties. That's a huge research effort here. Uh, computing, we do a lot, you, we try to use quantum algorithms to understand these interesting materials that we're creating here. And also to do very interesting applications, a lot of which involve scheduling um, and, and, and other areas as well. Uh, and I'm not the computing expert, but stick around on Friday and we'll hear more. Uh, in sensing, I've already mentioned a bit on this, but we design and, and, and create sensors based on these interesting materials and use them to explore different kinds of systems. And in education, we're trying to build a framework here at Mason to make sure that you guys can go out there and get the job you want in this kind of a space by creating you know, master's programs that involve internships and new courses that reflect the needs of the industry. Okay. So some of the things we do, we have seminar series, which I would really encourage you to come and attend, both in quantum materials and in quantum computing. Uh, we have this quantum week, and so you're all here, so you're already doing great, so thank you for that. Uh, and uh, I just want to tell you a couple other of the activities we can do that can help you get involved. We use our funding to sponsor seed projects. Some of you in this audience have benefited from them, but if your faculty advisor is interested in this sort of thing, and you can talk to them about it and they want to collaborate with someone in QSEC or if they are in QSEC and they want to collaborate with someone anyway, then you can get support via some of these mechanisms and see here are the kind of projects that we've, that we've funded in the past. Things from ranging from batteries to fundamental physics of iron predictives to helping, um, helping drone type thingies navigate and transport people around in the air using quantum algorithms. Right? So that's a really, a really broad portfolio we like to operate. We also try to make Mason better by building up its infrastructure. So we're creating a new user facility in Krasnow that will have a lot of the expensive, high cost instrumentation you need to do work in material science and other related fields. But it'll all be localized here and for everybody to use. So we're building that up. Um, we also do a lot of work in understanding what the future job landscape will look like for you guys. So we're a member of the QEDC. Um, which is a, a uh, consortium of academic industry and government people. 
And uh, with them, we published the first paper assessing the needs of what the quantum industry will build in the coming years. And the goal of that was to figure out how do we teach you guys best? Do we come up with a new department? Do we come up with a bunch of random degree programs? Do we supplement your existing degrees and give you those slight extra skills you need to land that next big job? And so, um, you know, we take that information and we use it to try to make sure we're providing you guys with the best opportunities. It sounds like I may be giving you this kind of sales pitch, right? You know, where it's like, you know, if you're a quantum mechanic, you can earn big profit, right? Dollar sign if you go and get that kind of job. That's not what I'm doing, we're realistic here. You know, we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is in the best interest of our students and will help them go out and succeed. Okay, so one of those things has been a master's concentration. We're prototyping in physics, hoping to spin it out across multiple departments. Uh, but we also are building up some new courses in cryogenics, fundamentals of quantum materials, systems engineering, but for scientists rather than engineers, all of which to help you guys be more competitive and, and get out there and do better. All right, so that's the end of my time, probably a few minutes ago. Uh, so I just want to say what's next for you here. So you've already taken the first step, right? You've come to come to quantum week day one. And so I've babbled for half an hour. Uh, next up, Dr. Rosenberg, Jessica Rosenberg is going to talk to, about, talk to you about the quantum education we do here at Mason. Uh, Dr. Michael Jarrett is going to talk to you about how to join the quantum industry. What does a career in quantum look like? How do you get there? And then we're going to have a poster session. And then we're going to play some board games. Because why not? that kind of day all right tomorrow we'll focus on quantum materials and applications and that'll include quantum sensing we'll have speakers from hopkins from nasa uh, a lot of speakers from mason highlighting their work here uh, and then we'll have a career panel at the end of the day involving people from mitre from intel uh, from a quantum startup foundry housed out of the university of maryland which helps entrepreneurs create businesses in quantum uh, and also uh, one of our own graduates who's now at a company called Sonatype as well. And then the last day, Friday, is all about algorithms and computing, quantum algorithms and quantum computing. And so Dr. Emilianenko sitting back in the black and pink top is going to start off the deck, uh, kicking off on quantum computing. Then we're going to have a speaker from MITRE tell us more about quantum computing and how to get involved. Uh, one of our new faculty here at Mason will talk a little bit then. And then we'll have a fireside chat about Mason quantum computing and again, how you can get involved and how you can use it to benefit your own research if that's what you're into too. So that's pretty much it. So what else is next for you? You know, get involved, ask us questions, join research teams, learn more about quantum from seminars, um, take classes and email us and let us know how we can help you. We want to help. We want to build this here. It's a really important, important thing we think for the next you know, generation both of technology and, and for our students. So thank you for your time and, my, and listening to my incoherent babbling, and I'll, I'll, I'll pause it there. How over time is mine? That's the first time that's ever happened. The clapping for me. Do we have any, do we go straight? Do we have questions? Any questions? Any questions, comments, or complaints? Online from, uh, Does that make sense? Um, let me see here. Do I have the power to do anything? Do I want to? Hey, Rashawn, talk. Rashawn. Rashawn. You got a question? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was by mistake. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Well, do you have a question now? No? Uh, not for now. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Jafar. Yeah, that's because I didn't tell you. So let me tell you about it. So can can you repeat the question, Patrick? Those of us online can't hear. So I showed everyone a bar plot and I didn't tell them anything about it, which was on purpose because I wanted to finish in time. So the question was, what's up with that bar plot? Did you make and, it bigger? Did you make it bigger? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I gotta do the thing. All right, so 
this bar plot comes from our paper on assessing the needs in the quantum industry here. And so what we were trying to show, what we were trying to assess in this bar plot is the following. You know, companies are demanding that academia build the pathway for workers who are literate in quantum science and engineering, who are able to go in and take their jobs. We wanted to know, what does that look like for you? Does that mean we do full degree programs or does that mean we augment existing skills? And so we asked them to tell us the skills they want, right? And so this is what we got back. Everything in orange is a skill that they wanted that um, is classified as non-quantum. It's a skill you would get in the course of a normal degree program. And the, along here are the different job classifications. So quantum companies advertising for a data scientist didn't want any squirrels, skills that squirrels, excuse me, um, skills that weren't quantum. They just wanted a traditional data science preparation. So you can be competitive and go for that without doing like a whole second degree. Um, things like photonics and optics engineer, like and scientists, the hands-on sort of stuff in there. You need some quantum skills. You need some training in actual optics and photonics related to quantum computing. But by and large, what we found is that most of the jobs in the quantum industry want you to have strong non-quantum skills with maybe just a little bit of quantum literacy sprinkled on top. So being strong in your core, but also being aware and educated in what quantum technologies are. So that was, that was one of the main outcomes. We're doing a second survey, another national survey right now. This was, about, I think about 57 companies that we surveyed all at different size scales from the big behemoths to the tiny startups. Uh, yeah, we're, we're doing a second round now. We're hoping to have even more. Oh, I'm staring into the owl. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you guys very much for your time and your attention. I'm going to sit in a chair and let Dr. Rosenberg tell us more things. Next session will be uh, from Jessica and Dr. Rosenberg. Um, I think we can start at the 1.40 on time. So, we have time and we want to get to the next goal. All right, so we'll do our six, we'll do a six minute break, kick off at 1.40. And I'm happy to chit chat with you if you're here. Jessica can't start her video. I just stop the share and see if that was okay. Oh, I did. I don't know if I enable it here. Woo. Good, good. Even better now. Was it hard to do anything?